introduce our guest. So, or our speaker. So the, uh, we have some business from the advisory board. The first is that we would really like everyone to take the, um, the survey that, we, that um, Dan Engster sent out about the you know, frequency of the events and um, the timing of them too. So if you can take that survey in the next week or so, that would be ideal. So please do that. Also, Helena Harata will be presenting um, in the next CARE Forum, and that's on April 28th from noon to 1.30, same time. And she's at the University of Paris, um, eight. Okay. So please register for that to attend it. All right, so let me turn to introducing our speaker for today. I'm delighted to be introducing Dr. Lena Maria Murillo today. As a historian, Murillo's work shows us how the history of reproductive care can clarify liberatory struggles for reproductive justice. Dr. Murillo is proving herself to be a leading public-facing scholar of reproductive justice, publishing many op-eds and professional blogs, including for the Washington Post and the Des Moines Register, and she's interviewed reg regularly about the historic and political context of abortion including for the Katie Couric podcast and Iowa Public Radio. Her forth forthcoming article in Signs on Race and Abortion in the U.S.-Mexico Borderlands won the 2023 Catherine Stimson Prize for Outstanding Feminist Scholarship. And I'm really looking forward to the publication of her book, Fighting for Control, Power, Reproductive Care, and Race in the U.S.-Mexico Borderlands. The promise of this book has been recognized by several prestigious fellowships, including from the AAUW, the ACLS, and the Ford Foundation. Today, Dr. Muriel will be presenting her new work in progress, and then we'll be opening the floor to discussion. So before I turn things over to her, let me remind you all to use the raise hand feature, and feel free to write questions into the chat if you don't want to ask a question yourself, and then I can read them during the Q&A. So without further ado, I'll hand over the floor to Dr. Murillo. Thank you, um, Asha, so much for that warm and very generous introduction. Um, I just wanna start off also by thanking Dan and um, Joan and Asha for um, bringing me on to the CARE Forum. And um, now that my book is kind of in the pipeline of being you know, sent back from the editor to review or to I'll have um, uh, more time to to be part of the forum um, and, and to hopefully shape the forum. And I've also um, I also want to thank um, Asha for um, first inspiring me to think about uh, care. Um, I think even though um, I think some of our um, ideas don't necessarily always kind of meet um, her her like our conversations have just been so generative and i don't think i would be um i would be where i am today with my book and, and other projects were it not for our conversations and so i just i want to um engage in a little bit of academic care one of my colleagues is using that term um with asha just to thank her so much um for that and and also um the neh philosophies of care workshop that happened last um Last summer, Dan was there and presented. Asha also presented. Um, I think some of my colleagues from that, uh, Tracy's here. Um, it was just such a beautiful experience, um, and especially working with um, folks who are in this kind of care universe. Um, Janelle Anderson, uh, Preeti Sharma, and Janet Jacobson were very influential in, in helping me think through reproductive care. And again, I'm a, I'm a historian, and historians. Um, they are like afraid of theory for some strange reason. Um, not always, but but generally. And so I'm sort of trying to work within um, within my discipline, but kind of stretching um, the use of some of these terms. So I'm going to start with with a narrative, as historians usually do. Um, Berta Gonzalez Chavez married Alberto Chavez in 1949 and continued against her mother-in-law's wishes to work. They lived in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, first with his mother and after some convincing 
they moved out on their own. At the age of 20, Chavez had had, had her first child. Soon after, she recalled that her cousin, quote, dragged me against my will to El Paso so I could get a diaphragm. And Ciudad Juarez and El Paso are sister cities right along the US-Mexico border. She could not remember the name of the clinic, but they did spend some time in El Paso's downtown before attending her appointment. Her use of contraception, she said, explained why there was such a large gap between her first and second child, nearly four years. By the time she had had her third child, Chavez and her husband had migrated to Los Angeles. Money was tight. Baby number three was only five months old when they arrived in the City of Angels, and with little economic support, she was unable to purchase the spermicidal jelly needed for her diaphragm to function properly. Quote, and like all men, they can't wait. Ugh, they have their needs. So I couldn't, I couldn't use my... And then, well, came my fourth son, she recounted. Her second, third, and fourth children came in rapid succession, 1954, 1955, and 1956, respectively. Although she had had, she had bought, excuse me, although she had brought her first diaphragm from uh, Los Angeles, um, or with her to Los Angeles, as the years wore on, she was unable to use it. And, um, and for nearly six years, or she was unable to use it, and the, finally the diaphragm broke. After her fourth child, somehow she was able to get a new diaphragm and was able to use it successfully for six years until her last child was born, the first one in a hospital in 1962. Despite her cousin taking her to, quote, obtain birth control against her will, Chavez knew a thing or two about reproductive control and reproductive health care. Quote, I told a lie. I was 14 years old, but I said I was 16, and this is how I became a nurse's apprentice at the hospital. From all accounts, Berta Chavez told this small fib to hospital management for her family's survival. Her father, Benito Gonzalez, had been a merchant in Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, when she was born in 1930. The family of five, three girls and two boys, along with her father and mother, her name is Refugia Lopez de Gonzalez, had traveled throughout Mexico during the early years of Chavez's childhood to accommodate her father's work. Her father's business had provided for them. She recalled that, quote, we were not rich, but we were also not poor. She was 12 or 13 when her father became ill and he could no longer continue to run his business. Within a year, Chavez and her eldest sister Lupe were forced to find work to help their mother and younger siblings survive. Before her apprenticeship at the hospital, Chavez had worked for a family member. The young woman had recently had two babies very close in age and asked Chavez to run errands to the market, cook and change, change and wash diapers. While this kind of work did not bother Chavez, she had hoped to do more. Chavez received a relatively good education for that time period. At one point, attending a private Catholic school as well as public school. She remembered that education had always been very important to her, um, to her family, especially her father. She finished her secondary education at night when she began training at the hospital. Her interest in medicine, however, stretched far beyond nursing. Chavez recalled that she had an aunt and cousin attending medical school, and they had inspired her to have a, quote, real profession as a doctor. But at the time, only nursing was open to her. When Chavez and her sister started in 1944, the hospital formalized their apprenticeship not only through on-the-job training, but also through night classes. Chavez remembered how she had trained, um, she had been trained by the hospital residents and other nurses. She had to take exams, written and oral, to be certified. Quote, once you pass these exams, she explained to me, then you received your title. And the title was not much, but it was something. At the very least, you could give patients injections, you could attempt births, and all those other things. Through her training as a nurse, Chavez knew a lot about reproductive health, contraception, and even abortion. At age 17, she went to work for Dr. Antonio Davalos, a well-respected physician and underground abortion provider in Ciudad Juarez. She knew him from her time at the hospital where he went occasionally to visit his patients. Davalos also had his own clinic and recruited Chavez because he appreciated her skills as a nurse and he also found her English proficiency, although limited, enough to help arrange visits between El Paso doctors who often cross perform surgeries in the Juarez Clinic. Despite attending Catholic primary school and catechism, 
Chavez did not find working for Davalos repugnant, nor did she judge the women who used his services. Instead, she found herself disparaging the men who, in her mind, had placed these women in such difficult circumstances. In addition to working with Davalos, Chavez took her knowledge outside of the hospital um, to make money to support her family. She often worked in various neighborhoods giving injections. Another quote from uh, Chavez. So much sun exposure and walking and living on little sleep because in those days you had to give people their penicillin doses every three hours, day and night, until the entire dosage was gone. So it was day and night. Sometimes I would have to stay in people's homes in their ranchitos and they would give me a ride back in the morning. Even though she had begun working outside the hospital to increase her income, she sometimes worked without pay. She mentioned that quote, many people could not pay me. They had no money or they would pay in installments, but it was something. Attending births, she mentioned, was better financially than providing injections. If we had a woman in labor, she remembered, we could charge more like 100 pesos and later we charged up to 200. We knew that if we had a birth that day, we would buy more meat. In the years before and after Chavez married, her life was bursting with intense reproductive care work. During oral, long oral history interviews with me in 2015 and her granddaughter, historian uh, Maricela Chavez in 1993, Chavez recounted her adventures working to help her family live after her father's illness prevented him from supporting his family. In laborious detail, Chavez described her knowledge and understanding of and respect for reproductive health care. And as she came of age um, in the post uh, borderlands era, um, she often supported people getting access to birth control and abortion. With a nearly 22 year gap between these oral histories, her voice remained clear about how much she had enjoyed the work she had done and how it had shaped her life afterwards. When asked why she worked so much aside from supporting her family, she said, for me, it was because I liked it and it was better than just staying home. While some may argue Berta Chavez's life was unusual and incredible and likely not representative of the lives of most Mexican origin women in the region at the time, I argue that her life was both extraordinary and conventional and the lives of the people she worked with and for are critical to understanding what I call reproductive care. Following the path of Chicana historians, um, who have been writing extensive histories for many decades about the lives of Mexican origin women in the late 19th and 20th centuries. Um, this, so what I'm, I'm going to present the sort of theoretical framework of reproductive care, part of it is, exists in my forthcoming book, and then also part of it I hope to really extend and flesh out more and maybe um, send it to Hypatia. I'm not sure, and I'd love to get feedback on this um, from folks today. Um, but I, my, my point is to, to think about reproductive care um, from the vantage point of the lives of historically marginalized and racialized women. Um, and for my book, it's really about the lives of Mexican origin women. And reproductive care then expands our understanding of how and perhaps why Mexican origin women specifically and women of color more generally in the early parts of the 20th century and throughout, throughout the, the century, participated in what today's scholars and activists call reproductive justice. And so here I'm going to go into the sort of the, ge the genealogy, how I'm kind of uh, mapping this out for myself. So reproductive care is critical to a broader theorization of reproductive justice in history. While it is not the only way to understand and grapple with the labor of Mexican origin women in the service of uplifting their own communities, it is important um, for framing it is an important framing for interpreting the dearth of sources that exist about their lives. So what is reproductive care? My definition is this. It is the sometimes radical or sometimes conventional everyday actions of racialized, minoritized, and marginalized community members to comfort, support, and uplift each other amidst the confines of state and non-state suppression, surveillance, and capitalist exploitation. Reproductive care has often been used as a shorthand for medical reproductive services, such as access to contraception, abortion, pap smears, pregnancy exams, perinatal care, cancer screenings, and more. 
while Mexican origin women accessing these critical reproductive services are clear examples of reproductive care, I seek to extend its meaning to account for how Mexican origin women in the direst of situations continued to care, comfort, support, and uplift members of their communities over decades and centuries to build and maintain safe and sustainable environments for themselves and their children, families, and future members. Reproductive care lives within a large overlapping and interlocking matrix of theories of, re of social reproduction, racial capitalism, theories of care, Chicana feminist methodologies of resistance and reproductive justice. An expansive constellation of mostly feminist analytical tools produced and enhanced since the late 1970s, these theoretical frameworks have informed how I imagine reproductive care operating when examining and interpreting past actions and words of historically marginalized and racialized people. In the paragraphs that follow, I sketch out the genealogy of reproductive care, leaving space for it to continue growing and flourishing in other his historical areas of study where silences attempt to reign supreme. So this is really within the reproductive justice universe that I seek to make reproductive care one of its primary stars. Let's revisit the tenets of reproductive justice to better express what relation it has to reproductive care. So reproductive justice pillars are the following. One, the right not to have children. Two, the right to have children. And three, the right to parent the children we have in safe and sustainable environments. Critical to these points of undergirding these ideas is the human right to bodily autonomy. Reproductive care interprets how historically marginalized and racialized women have engaged these three th tenets and to what extent community concerns, right? And by this, I, I, I'm very broadly defining community, nuclear family, extended kin circles, um, and broader involvement with friends and neighbors informed their own understanding of bodily autonomy and reproductive freedom. For instance, Scholars documenting the forced sterilization of Black, Indigenous, White, and Mexican origin women throughout the 20th century have shown how the state has engaged in denying racialized poor women the right to have children. These examples underscore the injustices within reproductive, just, re reproductive histories. However, reproductive care moves the analytical lens to an RJ analysis that is more than a denial of reproductive autonomy, even when this is a central claim. My dear colleague Natalie Lida's recent scholarship at the intersections of reproductive and disability justice provides an, an excellent example. She pushed the field to examine, to examine not only the relationship between survivors of sterilization and the state, but more importantly for enhancing reproductive care theory. Lida grounds survivors' relationships with each other. What does it mean um, when victims of this uh, kind of state violence um, are looking to uplift each other. Her research demonstrates that as sterilized individuals instit institutionalized, and often they were institutionalized um, in, in, um, in asylums uh, in California, is really the work of my, my colleague, Natalie Lida, um, Mexican origin women nonetheless continued supporting and uplifting those in their community. And in, in this moment, the community was other institutionalized, racialized people. Um, as an act of reproductive care and community solidarity. They engage in radical forms of community-based reproduction, reproducing spaces for love, understanding, and support despite the state stealing their fertility via coercive sterilization and their freedom through incarceration. Now, extending the meanings of reproductive care further, I make heavy use of social reproduction and racial capitalism together. A clear premise of reproductive care is that it recognizes the historical underpinnings of racialization as central to the social construction of gender and class. By setting colonialism, the usurpation of land and extraction of labor essential to white European settler conquests in the Americas at the end of the 15th century and the rise of racial capitalism, we can see how race, gender, and class were constituted together over time to justify the violence and theft colonialism produced. Reproductive care reinforces historical claims that racial formation co-constitutes gender and class formation throughout the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. 
while white Anglo-Saxons were themselves racialized, gendered, and class in relation to other groups during this time, reproductive care centers those at the very margins of the racial power structures these socially constructed hierarchies produced. Understanding the flows of power in this regard helped to under, under, help us understand the relationship of racialized groups to racial capitalism. Reproductive care necessitates a rigorous understanding of the compounding historical effects extractivist regime regimes at the center of racial capitalism have had on the lives of women of color the generational accumulation of exploitation and loss the consistent reinvigoration of subjugation under colonialism capitalism and neoliberalism and how real people products of these depraved historical forces continuously reproduce cycles of concern affirmation and reciprocal support for members of their communities Social reproduction theory helps bind reproductive care to the interstices of racial capitalism and gender formation. Social reproduction pinpoints the crevices in which reproductive care operates alongside and within extractive, extractive racialized and gendered capitalist labor regimes. Um, historian Tithi uh, Bhattachar Bhattacharya provides a robust synthesis of how social reproduction diagnostics work to make visible the lives of women laborers. She says the fundamental right of social reproduct reproduction theory is simply put that human labor is at the heart of creating a repro and or reproducing society as a whole. She clarifies this through a Marxist analysis of labor as a basis for capitalist exploitation, stating, quote, capitalism, however, acknowledges productive labor for the market as a sole form of legitimate work while the tremendous amount of familial as well as communitarian work that goes on to sustain and reproduce the worker, or more specifically her labor power, is naturalized into non-existence. Thus, for me, reading oral histories like the one provided by Berta Chavez shed light on the process by which social reproduction is, quote, naturalized into non-existence. Work done to heal, such as giving injections or labor carried out, um, to help birthing women becomes naturalized as women's work, women's non-commodity making work. What reproductive care seeks to do is to view this potent social reproductive power as more than just an invisible support to the continued accumulation of capital. Reproductive care is labor power. Its significance, however, lies in an oppositional interpretation, one that views labor power as a form of care redistributed among marginalized communities for their human benefit. To do so, reproductive care engages Chicana and US Third World Women feminisms, as well as Global South frameworks um, for a plur pluralistic, or what others have called the pluriversal rendering of existence and community. Reproductive care as a concept sits within this vast constellation of emerging paradigms, um, and concepts emerging from Chicana feminism, such as Chela Sandoval's Methodology of the Oppressed, Emma Perez's Decolonial Imaginary, and Gloria Zaldúa's La Nueva Mestiza, and of course, Maria Lugones's World Traveling, right? All of these uh, Latina scholars have engaged um, in these ideas, and I'm sort of setting uh, reproductive care within them. Um, what these various lines of theoretical analysis maintain is the need for understanding the pluriversalist worlds historically marginalized people inhabit, and the possibility for transformation within them. These worlds exist simultaneously, forcing women of color into the practice of what Maria Lugón is called world traveling, the necessary move between a white Anglo organization of life in the United States and other often intimate worlds of loving and care among women of color for their communities. And she says, right, I affirm this practice as a skillful, creative, rich, enriching, and given certain circumstances circumstances as a loving way of being and living. Um, although Lugones concedes that often women of color engage in this world traveling against their wills to confront a quote, hostile white supremacist patriarchal world, reproductive care then imagines this pluriversal, this move between worlds of racialized and historically marginalized women in the spirit as one that can be both coercive in support of capitalist extraction while simultaneously providing for their community in solidarity and love. What remains critical in these assessments for me is what Chela Sandoval recognizes as a distinct interstitial space occupied exclusively by US women of color because they have long understood that race, but also one's culture, sex, or class can deny comfortable or easy access 
to any legitimized gender category, that the interactions between social classifications produce other unnamed gender forms within the social hierarchy. Reproductive care then is a facet of labor power produced in a transformative third space. It is identified through actions and deeds in the service of communal intimacy and care, the often physical and always emotional work to make safe and sustainable communities for our children and future members of our society. It is through this third space, and, and here I use uh, Emma Perez's decolonial imaginary, that we begin to see and hear the power of reproductive care in the archive, right? And this is the work that I do as a historian. As Perez reminds us, the decolonial imaginary is how the silent regain their agency. Through reproductive care lens, Mexican origin women's work matters along different community and self-realizing axes, despite their labor's extractivist relationship to the accumulation of capital and often in support of the state. Uh, and you know, I've, I've sort of gone over this a little bit, um, but what I want to do is sort of use um, Bhattacharya's kind of focus on the worker um, as she's talking about the worker um, reproducing the image uh, of herself, her own needs and goals, and sort of thinking about what if we switched out the word um, worker um, with mother, migrant, sister, wife, cousin, daughter, lover, um, this pluriverse more closely aligns with the women that I'm writing about in my book. And for me, that, that sort of understanding them within that pluriverse um, is part of the work that reproductive care is, is attempting to do. Um, it's primarily, primarily concerned with the relationship of racialized and marginalized women to each other and their communities, not necessarily always to the state. It is not a relationship exclusively dictated by Eurocentric experiences of oppression and victimization, although certainly informed by them. Rather, it is an experience that considers that we cannot, um, as, as Gloria Zaldúa says, afford to stop in the middle of the bridge with arms crossed. Um, it is a relationship of intentional actions guided by care, love, and support in the face of repression, exploitation, and indignity. And so reproductive care is the active process of reestablishing the binds of community care needed for existing in this pluriverse with the potential for imagining new futures. Reproductive care is one tactic within the broader spectrum of the methodology of the oppressed and a critical point for decolonizing our imaginations. There can be no greater example of decolonial imaginaries than working to produce hospitable environments for our children and future members to live and survive, even as present members experience brutality, alienation, and oppression. In this way, reproductive care brings reproductive justice to life. And, and here I'm, you know, I'm thinking about um, many of the, the philosophers actually who are on this call now, um, and their definition of care has also been obviously incredibly helpful to understanding the underlying values needed for actions that constitute caring labor and reveals who has historically benefited from the values of care and its labor. Right, for instance, political theorist John Trancha's assessment that certain values were used to define women's morality, especially in the late 19th and early 20th century US context, gender notions of nurturance, attentiveness, compassion, and meeting other needs. These values were traditionally associated with women and traditionally excluded from public consideration, even as white women and men attempted to politicize them as moral justifications for white women's entrance into the political sphere. The historical claim for me here, this is really important, um, to a gendered analysis of care helps reinforce the importance um, reproductive care plays in understanding the lives of women of color in the past. As white male capitalists and their women counterparts exploited Mexican origin women's post natural tendencies towards care, nurturing and raising their white children, cooking and cleaning in their homes, and toiling away in their factories, Mexican origin women were nonetheless denied the social and cultural capital that came with the maintenance and preservation of white domesticity, white productivity, and ultimately white supremacy. This denial not only social and cultural capital, but also material capital, right? They, they were exploited, working with um, sort of under exploitative wages, 
produce what Marxists refer to as an alienation from, um, from their labor. As a corrective to this disassociation, um, I argue Mexican origin women engaged in nurturing with compassion and dignity the lives of the members of their communities. Mexican origin women engaging in reproductive care labor helped minimize the effects of capital exploitation, racialization, and everyday oppressions. But what was more than simple maintenance, and I would argue this is more than simple maintenance and harm reduction, Mexican origin women engage in reproductive care to ground their humanity and dignity to their families, children, and their broader communities. And so the above theories infuse reproductive care with meaning not only to further theorize reproductive justice in history, but also to make visible the care labor needed to make reproductive justice possible. Racialized, minoritized, and marginalized community members provide reproductive care, defined again as the radical or quotidian actions used to comfort, support, and uplift each other amidst the confines of state and non-state suppression, surveillance, and capitalist exploitation. Because reproductive justice maintains that people can have the children they want to have or not have children at all, and that they are all engaged in the efforts to raise their children in safe and sustainable communities. This requires for me a theory of labor that decenters capitalism and the state as the only sources wielding the power to produce and consume. Reproductive care accounts for the loving labor produced by Mexican origin women in this pluriverse. The, the adage, cada uno pone su granito de arroz, or everyone puts in their grain of salt, of rice, may sound um, trite, I guess. Um, and yet it makes visible the reproductive cycles of concern and care, the very act of placing the metaphorical grain of rice over and over again on a plate provides a critical visual of racialized communities drive to survive the violence, both physical and structural, of racial capitalism enough to imagine futures where their communities are fed and maintained. In this scenario, women of color tap into um, this oppositional consciousness, right, that Chela Sandoval so beautifully describes, or what Anzaldúa also called the sort of mestiza consciousness. And, and this is birthed through living and resisting um, from, from my work in the US-Mexico borderlands. That for me produces the will to care um, for their communities, despite their marginality to cultural and material capital and power. Even as caregiving and nurturing um, have been viewed by some as gendered burdens. Philosopher Asha Bandari aptly notes that, quote, identifying the domain of caregiving as a domain for human genius yields a place from which to recuperate one's dignity and a sense of mutual communal responsibility. Reproductive care makes visible what was rendered invisible and even perhaps unthinkable by racial capitalism, patriarchy, and the arrogance of white settler history. Um, lives uh, loves and care labor like the one um, of Berta Chavez Gonzalez. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, there's so much to think about here. So let's open that. Let's open the queue for questions. So use the raise hand function to get into the queue, and I will also pull up the chat. I can start us off with, uh, with a question while we wait for people to formulate their thoughts. Um, so one thing that I was thinking about during the um, talk, and we've talked about this a little bit, but um, not, not so much um, so far, is what makes the um, kind of labor you're describing reproductive care rather than care. So why define it as reproductive care and um, not as care? And part of what you, one, one of the things that you said, I think um, provide part of the answer, but I wonder if you can, you can elaborate on it. So it seems like that, you know, if the main aim is to create hospitable environments for our children, then this, this the, the notion of reproduction is then very much central. It's about lineages and communities, right? And so um, is that, is it because the primary aim of reproductive care is to create hospitable environments for our children um, that the, the concept you're developing is a concept 
that's essentially kind of reproductive rather than simply care rather than so and I guess more broadly my question is um, you know whether or related to that you know what is the relationship between reproductive care as a concept and then you know care as a concept with you know some of the definitions that others have offered um I think that you know you you hit the nail on the head for me it's about expanding um what the sustaining that part of of reproductive justice right that that definition sustaining um the maintenance of of um, hospitable environments and communities uh and that is a, a continue that's a continual remaking right um if not uh if not a supporting of existing structures and um, and organizations, so it's something that I want to dig into deeper. But it's also about um, engaging in futurity and and thinking about that there is some that there that that the toil that's being engaged in at that particular moment is not just. Um, for uh, producing safe and sustainable environments in the present, but also this sort of future um, future understanding um, that there that there might be something better later. And in, in many ways, I think that this is very much tied to um, kind of narratives of migration. Um, and, you know, that's something I, I, I need to dip into a little more. Part of me is uh, hesitant, I'll be honest, because I think that there's the that there's the ability to kind of reinvigorate tropes about migration and that people are migrating simply to have a better life. And, and I think that sometimes that that um, can uh, be used, you know, especially um, in sort of public facing work in, in a very, um, in very simple ways. Um, but I think that there is something to um, the work of, of people like Emma Perez and, and, you know, what does it mean um, to be within this marginalized community, um, to understand ourselves within this broader history of, of colonialism, and what does it mean to imagine future? Uh, and so I think that for me, that is part of that reproductive care labor and so i'm sort of connecting it to these quotidian moments of um you know i'm thinking about um and i should say so berta chavez gonzalez or berta gonzalez chavez excuse me um mrs chavez as i as i knew her she's the mother of my mentor of my dissertation chair at the university of texas el paso ernesto chavez who's a historian of chicano history and you know he read this chapter and he you know called me and was just like i didn't know how hard my mom's life had been you know and he and he's the youngest one he's the baby that's born six years later um after a use of birth control in a hospital and so for me there's something to that um that she toiled right as she said day in and day out in the sun giving injections to people um as a very young woman because she understood somewhere that there was a possible future in this toil for some members of her community and um she passed away two years ago and having her son read it who's now a you know professor and um, well-known expert on, on the history of Chicanos in the United States, he had not realized the kind of reproductive labor and reproductive care work his mom had engaged in. And so I, I'm, I'm still thinking through these ideas as my, my answer to you, Asha, but I do think that there's a maintenance that um, I think goes on beyond the immediate, that immediate present moment um, and and there is a, I guess I'm trying to draw a deeper meaning from that that kind of labor and work. Well, and I do wonder if if um, part of the backdrop for the claim is that um, you know people in these communities have their lives threatened. So you know you 
alluded to that uh, that component of your work, but um, I wonder if racial capitalism in that way is really a, a sort of fundamental premise in the argument that the sort of reproduction of a community and the sustaining of a community for a future generation is something that's in battle, right? It's in danger. And so it, it becomes salient in a way that it's not maybe in, in some of our um, care, care theory literature, right? When we're not um, working from sort of communities that are, you know, killed. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let me move on to Dan, to call on Dan. Yes, uh, thank you, Lena. That was great. I have a, I have a bunch of um, thoughts, but uh, at least a couple of questions. I'll just uh, focus on one, one of my questions here. Um, and I, I mean, so, so I found, I found, you know, all you're talking about. I think, I think is very interesting. Um, and I, I guess that what I want to hear a little bit more about is, is just is. Um, you know, as I, as I understand what you're saying, right, you're talking about a, a specific kind of care that happens uh, in this marginalized community among women. And I kind of want to hear more about like kind of uh, this, this fleshed out idea of what this care is and how it fits within, within the larger, that larger community of care. Um, so, you know, so I guess this is, you know, I mean, I actually, you know, you're like, you know, your opening uh, story about Mrs. Chavez, that was great. Um, you know, I, 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 I guess I'm almost asking for more of these kinds of stories, but then I'm asking sort of to pull out from these stories, you know, these sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, I don't know, um, characteristics, but more, you know, I don't, um, uh, characteristic maybe, uh, vignettes or something, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking of this and I'm, you know, I'm imagining, uh, these women who, are, you know, who are in this, this community and they're specifically, uh, right, this community where, uh, they're expected to care for everyone else. And then this is this, this, um, almost like underground kind of care that they're providing for each other. Um, often, you know, maybe sometimes, uh, with, but probably oftentimes without the full knowledge of their husbands or their parents, right? It could be a, you know, a niece whose aunt takes her for, you know, contraception and, uh, and kind of, you know, um, uh, you know, kind of underneath the, the church, but, you know, sometimes the church is involved in these things in, in weird ways. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, um, I, 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 I come from Youngstown, Ohio, and and uh, I, all these weird kind of stories of the church's involvement, uh, or that, that I hear from my parents, like the church's involvement, uh, you know, with um, uh, organizing abortions or mm -hmm. organizing adoptions, kind of, you know, um, uh, below the, the- The clergy <laughs> consultation service. Was <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, so anyway, I, I guess I'd just like to kind of hear a little bit more about that. And I mean, I'm really interested in this idea of, of that unique kind of care that's happening here uh, underneath this, you know, the, I usually when we talk about care, we're talking about like, oh, the, you know, oh, the care in the community and the care of children and, and, uh, um, and noting, you know, that, that, that this is very, uh, this tends to be gender, but now you're you're kind of it's it's like this this step below that this care that's happening below the surface having to do with specifically uh, reproductive issues, um, and so so I guess I just want to hear a little bit more about that of what you know what that care is like. Absolutely, and I'm glad <laughs> I'm glad you asked to tell you more on my stories. Um, there there's a lot. So like I said, this. What I just read today, I'm kind of going to shorten it a little bit in my book so that I can add actually more um, more texture uh, from from the not just oral histories, but from many um, histories that I've been able to locate where people are both talking about access, you know, getting access to um, to birth control and, and abortion and, and other things. Um, kind of, you know, underground. Um, and and what I didn't really talk about today, and I set up obviously much more in my book is the degree to which, you know, and this is to in some ways answer Asha's point also, the sort of giving the 
bigger context for um, for racialization and racial formation in the borderlands, right? Specifically, but um, you know, just talking more broadly about um, the you know extreme racial hierarchies in the United States and, and what that's looked like over the span of of the late nineteenth and, and twentieth centuries. And so I really do come, so this chapter is kind of like in the middle of the book, right? I've done a lot of work before to sort of set the stage um, to, to show like, so to show like what conditions these women are doing this kind of care work and labor work in, right? It's a very, you know, I talk about surveillance. I mean, they are very much surveilled um, in the US-Mexico borderlands. Uh, and this is period when the US is, um, rethinking immigration regimes. Um, oftentimes people lived in Ciudad Juarez, right? Uh, Berta Chavez does this, right? She lives in, in Ciudad Juarez and then she goes to El Paso all the time. That's not always easy for people. Um, and so what does it mean to live in a place where there is essentially um, de facto segregation, right? There, It's not some scholars are working on this notion of Juan Crow, so not Jim Crow, but Juan Crow in the way that Mexican origin people were themselves segregated, right? So in, in places like El Paso, they they had Mexican schools. They did not go to school with other Anglo children. Um, healthcare was very much segregated, right? So what does it mean? Um, there have been essentially countless studies on, on that relationship of Mexican origin people to the state and to society, but rarely do we see um, other than when we're talking about, you know, the Chicano movement or moments of like, you know, mass resistance, where do we see that everyday resistance and solidarity? Um, and what I'm arguing in my book is that you can't have the Chicano movement without people like Berta Chavez Gonzalez toiling away in people's homes and helping members of her community survive, you know, tuberculosis and other diseases. Um, uh like that 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 moment wouldn't happen without that sort of basic level um care work not just reproductive care right so not i mean reproductive services and abortion and but that it that it we sh we have to stretch beyond that given the circumstances under which they're living and so um there are some other women who um, i didn't interview they're actually part of a much larger project that was done in the 1930s by um, an anthropologist, Manuel Gamio, who interviewed hundreds of Mexican men, um, farmer workers. A lot of his um, stuff is at, um, I think it's at the Bancroft Library. And he does, in, in between here and there, he does interview some women. And many of these women were actually considered, in, in other people's work, they were considered to be prostitutes. But as, as I was doing my own research, they're not. They're called dime dancers. They would go and dance with men at um, local clubs and stuff. And so there's two um, incredible, just beautiful um, interviews that one of um, Manuel Gamio's um, researchers did with these two women, um, with two different women who just talk about this world of community care that they've built with essentially community members that have been tossed to the side who who don't um, you know have proper families right this is in the uh, in the shadow of the Mexican Revolution where there was a lot of bloodshed a um, lot of mass migration um, to the United States and these two women create these spaces and they say we know that our broader community does not respect what we do that we live in a house with other men who aren't our husbands. Um, and, you know, we're not loose women, but we need to provide for our community members. And so we go dime dancing because we can make money this way, but we also pay our rent in ways that some of these men cannot. And, and so that's why we're here living with them. And they're, they're more, they, you know, this one woman says about one of the men that she lives in, in the apartment with her, she says, he's been more helpful to me than my father or anyone else would ever be. Um, and this is in the 1930s, right? So it's about pushing back from these like really tired stereotypes of who Mexican origin women are supposed to be. Um, and, and so for me, that's where I'm kind of trying to push and, and like, this is a community 
based um, and not, you know, organically produced love for community in the midst of like, you know, like essentially, I mean, Mexican Revolution was was very much that it was revolutionary, it completely destroyed Mexico for like 20 years. Um, and so here are these small spaces where we see people kind of trying to rebuild um, and transform uh, themselves and, and their community members um, in these really hostile environments. I hope that's, <laughs> sorry, so long winded. Okay, well, we'll move on, we'll move on to Amber and then I mean, there can be follow-ups too later. Amber, you're up. Thank you so much for this talk. This has been really interesting and um, I'm excited to learn this history. I'm a political theorist and a really sloppy historian. Um, and so, you know, I'm excited. Hey, welcome to them all. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really excited to read this really uh, particular history when the book comes out. And so I, but I'm kind of a little more interested um, you know, you talk about reproductive care as a facet of labor power. You had a lot of Marxist language uh, when you were talking about alienated labor and social reproduction. Uh, you know, and I started thinking through, like, sometimes when you were explaining this history, you know, especially when women during this time were performing reproductive care for white families, I could see how exploitative and alienated that form of labor was. And then, you know, you're kind of presenting this kind of more romantic a view of labor within communities, but I just, I'm teaching from this theory this semester, and I just had the, um, the moment kind of uh, last week where I had a Chicana student who shared her experience and just bemoaned the differential treatment that she got from her brothers, right? Mm. I, this domesticity has been imposed upon me. I, you know, my brothers get away with murder. I have to take care of everybody. It's exhausting, you know? And so I'm thinking, you know, it seems like this within communities and then having the labor exported outside of the community doesn't really get us to an understanding of when this labor is exploited and when it's not. And so I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Absolutely. And I think, you know, part of me and I, you know, so I teach Latina, Latino, Latinx studies here at the University of Iowa. And um, it's interesting because I, I often get um, you wouldn't think, but I often get, you know, second, sometimes even third generation um, Chicana and Chicano students. Um, first off, they never, some of them never heard the word Chicana or Chicano, so it's new to them. And, and so we talk about, um, we talk about migration to the Midwest. Um, we talk about why some of their families didn't settle in Chicago and settled in Iowa instead. Um, and part of it is trying to push back um, on some of those kind of tropes of machismo, right? And so while, the, I mean, and tropes of family and tropes of motherhood and tropes of, um, of uh, kind of acquiescence to, um, to religion, right? So I start off very much putting forward um, Berta Chavez's use of birth control and like I said, when I uh, showed this to my my mentor, this was his mother. And then I shared this with Maricela Chavez, who is um, who you know also this is her grandmother. Interview Berta Chavez. Um, she was like, she you're the first person she ever told right that she used birth control. That's really fascinating, right? Because um, it probably would not have been a discussion. Her maybe her husband didn't know, and maybe right like I think. I think part of it, and you know, and I, I appreciate your term. I'm not attempting to romanticize their experiences, um, and certainly not trying to talk about them as easy or simple. They were working within um, patriarchal systems, both in Mexico and in the U.S. Right? Uh, what I try to do with my students and say, like, patriarchy is borderless. <laughs> patriarchy travels. It is. Um, in many ways, uh, um, cultureless and raceless, um, despite stereotypes um, that um, seem to persist. And so what I've done in some of the other chapters, right, that I don't, um, that I don't necessarily, didn't necessarily get to talk about in this is, is that sort of um, cultural and social milieu that these women are living in on both sides of the border. 
um, and how uh, not only um, Mexican origin women, but also how white women absorbed these kind of patriarchal ideas. Right. So my first few chapters, I, I focus on the history of Planned Parenthood in El Paso, and I write very, uh, spent a lot of time writing about the white women who who created that organization, El Paso, exclusively. Their language was very clear um, that it was about um, uplifting Mexican origin women from the drudgery of too many children. Um, it was very eugenic ideology, right? And we know that Planned Parenthood has since in the last like 10 years had a reckoning with people like Margaret Sanger and so forth. Um, and, and Margaret Sanger died in, uh, in Tucson, Arizona. She spent lots of time in El Paso helping the women that I write about put together this clinic. Um, they put together clinics all along the Southwest in Arizona and in Southern California. And they were primarily focused on controlling the reproduction of Mexican origin women, right? So I, I, I essentially try to say like, yes, right? Like, we can talk about our individual families and some of the way that patriarchy and racism um, and certainly colorism and other, other other isms come up in our personal families. But when we look at the sort of structural and social um, spaces that these women were engaged in and working in, um, the lives of some of the women that I, I'm able to kind of, you know, trace through um, uh, archives where uh, they were not meant to exist um, tells us that there's actually this like very unknown un untapped into world where they were surviving um, for themselves and for each other and supporting each other like you know Berta doesn't mention her cousin um, other than to say that it was her cousin who dragged her to get birth control, but I want to know more about her cousin and who else the cousin dragged to get birth control, right? Like, how is this creating this sort of um, broader network of, of women who um, heard about the clinic and then went and got care there? So I, I guess my point is I'm not necessarily trying to, and I, 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 I'm very much taking this, um, your comment to heart, I'm not trying to romanticize or say that they weren't um, combating uh, cultural stigmas, both in the US and in Mexico, um, but that's what I think makes that much more interesting, the work of women like Berta, um, who, you know, <laughs> stood up to her mother-in-law who apparently was a tyrant and to her husband and, and finally was like, we're, we're moving out of this house and I'm gonna continue to work despite the fact that everyone hates that I'm doing it and that I'm, I'm, I'm getting pregnant and having children and I'm not staying home always to raise them, but I'm going out to work um, because it's what makes me, it's what makes me happy, right? Um, anyway. So we have a question in the chat um, from Sarah Munawar. Uh, I can read it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Murillo, for such a thoughtful and life-affirming presentation. I have two connected questions. What role does place, uh, does land placemaking play in your vision of reproductive care by which racialized communities make more inhabitable worlds through the reclamation of land or placemaking and the right to inhabit attachments to the land? And how does such community care attend to ecological violence, not only to indigenous people's relations to land, but also the violence of displacement against migrants as threats to reproductive health? So there are several questions here. I'll read, I'll read the last one, and then you might want to uh, break them down, I guess. How can such reconceptualizing of land as a relation that is essential to reproductive justice be included in hospital policy approaches to culturally safe care for Black Indigenous communities? This is, you know, their thoughts more than a demand um, for answers. Um, I love these questions. I, I need to sit and think with them. Um, you know, for me, the idea of land and placemaking, and this is why, you know, I, I'm hedging in some ways to, like I, I want to think about repro I basically I want to kind of theorize reproductive care a little bit and then just sort of leave it for others to do because I really am in many ways sort of concerned with 
um, with the borderlands um, and the way that the way that it produces the you know the landscapes under which these women are attempting to survive um, and and I don't, you know, I guess for me, I don't always, I try to go back and forth between whether or not they're always thriving. <laughs> um, because I think that, you know, especially as I, I've reread and reread um, Berta's oral history and several other women's, like, they thrive at certain moments, right? And I think that that's like such a human thing. Um, there are moments when we really feel like things are going well, and then, and then that that seems to be kind of fleeting, right? Then we're back in the drudgery uh, of things, um, and so I think that the displacement um, and the ability to um, to attempt to continue reproductive care, um, even in those moments of displacement, for me are are things that I'm thinking about um, a lot. I'm, I'm actually working with a student now who is writing um, a history of detention uh, and child, looking at the history of children's detention. Um, and this for me gets very much at that sort of last pillar of reproduct reproductive care. How do we make safe and sustainable environments for our children um, in a detention center? Uh, as they are um, victims of of U.S. and, and global, um, you know, economic exploitation, and that's why they've had to leave their home countries and have migrated oftentimes thousands of miles to end up in a U.S. Uh, detention center. Um, so I'm, I'm going to think about these things. Uh, the ecological question to me is also one that's really important, especially again around migration. Um, and I know that reproductive justice um, scholars and activists are very much attuned to this um, when it comes to environmental injustices. And again, how do we make safe and sustainable environments when um, for, you know, how do we reproduce that kind of care when increasingly migrants are being pushed to travel very dangerous areas um, along the US Mexico border on purpose right where they're being denied entry. Um, uh, into certain po points of entry that would be the sort of more natural place for them to enter but deeper into um, deserts. Um, causing you know huge spikes in, in mortality rates among migrants so all of these you know questions again I, I it's hard for me to not want to come to sort of present day um, issues um, to think about these things, but they are definitely uh, ruminating in my mind as I as I as I try to rewrite and rewrite my epilogue because um, this uh, moment is never ending. Um, but I, I I'm going to think about what what um, Sarah asked. I think that's really important. Thank you. Okay, and and she wrote a. Uh, uh, Thank you. Her um, she has a laptop glitch, so that's why her camera. Okay. So, okay. Joan Toronto is next. Hi, Lena. Thank you so much. This is Hi, Joan. Thank you. Wonderful work. Very um, generative. And ask you're asking a lot of really good questions, and providing us with some really wonderful stories and narratives about real people's real lives. One word that occurred to me as you were speaking was the word hope. And I actually think hope is an important element of care that we often don't pay enough attention to. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that was resonating in my mind. Um, I have to tell you that my most recent ways of thinking is not to focus on good care, but on bad care, and to look at the ways in which bad care frames what we do and how we might think about care differently. But two questions occurred to me as I was hearing your talk that are maybe related, maybe not. One is about um, the people you've talked to, the people you um, highlight in your talk are really inspirational. But there must be other women who don't care about reproductive care in this way. And what's your take on them? How do you think about them, about their lives? 
Are they just not engaging in reproductive care? In other words, is reproductive care something that one almost intentionally has to understand in order for it to work? And the second question is an Occam's razor question, which is, um, what does talking about reproductive care add that talking about reproductive justice doesn't get us to? Mm -hmm. what, what else can we get from this concept? Sorry, there's a phone ringing here. I'll turn this off. Hmm. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't like to set up kind of these binaries of who's in, you know, historians are like, but there's so much nuance and there is, right? <laughs> um, but I would argue actually that the that some of the white women I write about um, the ones that are, are attempting to create or establish Planned Parenthood and eventually do in El Paso in the 1930s um, are often engaging in bad care uh, and despite their you know and so for them we do have like oodles of, of archives because they were very good to keep you know, their speeches and um, and they clipped, you know, there's mountains of, of newspaper clippings of every time um, their organization was mentioned in the newspaper, right? Um, so, you know, based on what some of them would say um, and their reasoning for why we need, you know, why El Paso needed so um, urgently uh, birth control clinics, was because of you know their desire to control population in the 1930s, and what's fascinating is that um, when they you know Margaret Sanger suggested that they name the clinic um, the Mother's Health Center when it first opened, that was kind of this generic term that she told you know as she would go around the country and helping people start clinics, she would say use this, it's, this is what's going to get people in the door. Of course, she knew that that was because the people that would often go to these clinics were you know, economically strapped folks, right? Um, and like, you know, Linda Gordon's written a lot about this and right, like she knew, she, you know, she was very, she was very thoughtful about, um, about, you know, framing and, and the sort of propaganda that went around, around it. But, you know, a lot of women in El Paso, Mexican origin women would go to the clinic with their babies, you know, who were sick, tuberculosis was, horrific um, in, in El Paso. And actually El Paso had one of the highest rates of infant mortality in the country. And women would go with their babies and then they would be turned away by people in the clinic because they're like, we're not here to save babies. We're not here to treat other illnesses that you might have. We're here specifically to offer birth control. And this is while they had paid nurses on their staff, right? And, and the only staff for a long time that they paid was their nurses, uh, their nurse, they would have one nurse. Um, and then they had physicians who worked as volunteers and they would turn these people away. And there's, I have this like, great quote by one of the uh, board members who says, um, we need to put birth control in our sign. We need to just be clear about what we're doing here because too many people are coming here asking for things that that's not what we're doing. We are offering intentionally the control of birth. That's, that's what we're doing. Um, and so for me, I would argue um, that that kind of spirit is, uh, is, is part of that sort of bad care. So even as they are providing a resource and a service, um, you know, they are, they're not, um, they're not, they're not, they're not really engaged the, with a community in a complicated way. Um, and so, you know, and then your second question, what is reproductive care doing that reproductive justice is not doing? For me, reproductive care is the like, is the how do we get to the justice part, right? Like what, like it's that, it's the action um, uh, to, to the justice. Um, and this is not to say that justice is also static. Um, I, I, and I'm not saying that they're necessarily in conflict with one another. But I think that it offers a place for people to think about the actual work of care and the actual work that it takes to, to, to have justice, right? And that oftentimes these are, that, that it needs to be maintained, right? And 
I often when I'm teaching this these things to my students and they're like all you know they're very surprised and shocked and obviously upset about what's going what you know what happened with Roe um and they're like how did this happen you know I'm like none of these things are stable we have to constantly work towards the preservation of these things right this, this kind of care involved um for justice you know it's, it's reproductive always and so um you know to to you know, Roe is actually sadly a great example of why we the work always continues. Once we've got you know reached a certain milestone, it doesn't mean we're done. Um, and so, for me, that's what I think reproductive care. I hope it does um, is, is to show that you know how, how is it that people are 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 working towards justice. Thanks. That's that really helps. Thanks a lot. No, thank you, Joan. Do we have more questions? I know a couple of people had to leave early and they uh, thank you for your talk. Thank you. Questions from others in the group or comments? Aw, Elizabeth. <laughs> I'm just looking at all the messages from folks who were at the NEH. Um, care for them, which was so beautiful. I wonder if you could um, review your definition of community. It went by kind of quickly and I thought it, it was um, an interesting take on it because it includes family, right? Mm -hmm. And, and then, extended kinship yeah. circles and um, neighbors. And um, again, I think for me, it's about, you know, again, pushing back on some of the stereotypes I've had. <laughs> I've had very well-meaning students say things like, oh, I know how much uh, Mexicans or Latinos, like, you know, I'm, I know how much family means to them. Um, and I'm, I, I bristle at that because I think, you know, that's not something that's just exclusive to um, to Latinos or or um, or Mexicanos, but um, also the fact that um, that the perception that family is important and that community is important has a lot to do with um, the lack of of state support um, and state funded um, access to care such that people uh and there are some great oral histories actually at um at at the ratcliffe institute um that loretta ross did like years ago when she was a fellow there um and she did so with several activists um one of the sort of godmothers of of chicana feminist activism is um elizabeth martinez betita martinez and, you know, Betita says this in one of her interviews, she says, you know, the reason, you know, if you want to say that Mexicans are super connected to their family, sure, you can say that, but she said something to the effect of it's because sometimes that's all we had, the, you know, the state that we had no government support of any kind. So all we had was our family. And so we, you know, we broadly met by family, we met our neighbors our, you know, uh, the, the person at the, um, at the market, the whoever had extended a hand of support and, and solidarity in certain moments of, of, you know, extreme loss, whether it was through poverty or, or death or what have you, um, those people became our family. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I remember hearing that and it wasn't much a much more complicated and like I said, given the history, um, a much more deeply grounded uh, assessment of what family means and what community means. Um, and and so for me, it's, you know, it, it is that it's the broader kinship circles, neighbors, um, but certainly family and family can be broadly, broadly defined. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Yeah. So it's sort of the caregiving unit, maybe. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, it's, these things are never stable. Um, I think that that's what's so critical uh, for me is, is to show that these things are always, um, you know, it's 
it can be fleeting sometimes um, those kinds of resources that community members might have for care. Um, I can't imagine, you know, somebody like Berta Chavez who was working in her neighborhood for five or six years where everybody knew that she was the one that gave injections and then all of a sudden she leaves, right? She goes to LA and their, you know, kind of main resource for, um, for that intensive care um, is gone. Uh, you know, I wondered to what degree, you know, people missed her in her community. Um, anyway. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so last call for questions or comments. Thank you all. I know it's a long, a long uh, conversation, but I appreciate it so much. It's very generative. Well, there's so much to think about here, and this is such a, um, a provocative new concept, this concept of reproductive care. So um, I, I think it's really given us a lot to kind of think about in relation to care theory and reproductive justice and, and how you're um, kind of working between those frameworks. So, all right. Well, let's thank our speaker. Thank you, Professor Maria. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I appreciate right. it. Much. All right. And everyone, remember to fill out the survey. Okay. Good. I'm seeing so many nods. It's, it's so gratifying when, <laughs> yes, we <do>. <laughs> <laughs> when we're on a Zoom and we get that, that um, confirmation. So good. And our next, our next lecture will be Helena Harata on April 28th. Awesome. Thank you. Bye, all. Bye. Thank you so much. Oh.